So you got The Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon. I've quoted him uh, several times in the Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire videotape, my Rainbow, uh, Reading Rainbow series. I'm just doing a bunch of summarization of different books, and I'm summarizing Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. So it's, uh, it sets up a praxis for the oppressors, the, the people who are oppressed, their liberation. So, where was I? So, the oppressor, the oppressed want to become the oppressors, and the only thing that they understand is, is manhood is one of power, control, and domination. So, when the oppressed become the oppressor, they act as a man the same way the oppressor act as a man. Without freedom, you cannot exist authentically, but the oppressor has this duality within their innermost being. And they desire freedom, and they also desire an authentic existence, but at the same time they fear freedom because it exists outside the confines of the guidelines of the oppressor. In order for the oppressed to be able to wage the struggle for their liberation, they must perceive the reality of the oppression, not as a closed world from which there is no exit, but as a limiting situation that they can transform. The goals of the oppressed is humanization and emancipation of labor, overcoming alienation and affirmation, opposing the oppressors as an act of love because it attacks the lovelessness that exists at the core of the oppressor. The oppressed want to be men, but their idea of manhood comes from the oppressor. The professors are the oppressors, and the oppressed there exists a duality. They have internalized the views of the oppressor, and they also see themselves and their role with the same eyes as the oppressor. So they see themselves as they see themselves, and as the oppressor sees them. This is called prescription. The prescription is when the oppressor prescribes the oppressed with their own consciousness. And that's when the professors impose their idea of the oppressed behavior and their image. They say, think in the way that I think about things. Freedom is a necessary but not sufficient condition to become fully human. And the oppressed realize that without freedom they can't exist authentically. But while they desire to exist authentically, they also fear it. There's a fear of freedom. Both the oppressed and the oppressor have a fear of freedom. Both of their roles are clearly defined by the oppressed and the oppressor. For the oppressor and the oppressed. One is up, one is down. One is master, one is slave. And so by them becoming liberated, they'll break free from that hierarchical relationship of which both per participants understand the oppressor cannot relinquish his or her power and the oppressed can't stand up to the oppressor to destroy the hierarchical relationship and to assert their autonomy and responsibility for themselves the oppressed have to understand that their situation is a limiting situation that they can transform functionally oppression is domesticating to no longer be prey to oppression one must emancipate themselves and then turn the whole system over and free everybody. They must dedicate their life to the overthrow of all oppression everywhere in defense of humanity. They must reflect on society and they must act upon it. Only the oppressed, by freeing themselves, can free the oppressors. The oppressors can free neither them or the oppressed. The sadistic love is a perverted love. The sadistic love is the love of the oppressor. Perverted. It's a love of death. It's not a love of life. One of the characteristics of the oppressor consciousness and its necrophilic view of the world is the sadism. The pleasure and the complete domination over another person, over an animate creature, is the very essence of the sadistic drive. Another way of formulating the same thought is to say that the aim of sadism is to transform a man or a woman into a thing, into an object, something animate, something inanimate, to something animate to something inanimate. Since only by complete and absolute control, the living loses the one essential quality for life, freedom. Trust in the people is the indispensable precondition for revolutionary change. Only those revolutionary educators who authentically commit themselves to the people must re-examine themselves constantly. And this conversion is so radical as to not allow ambiguous behavior. The oppressed have a passion and attraction towards the oppressor. So y'all watch out for that. Self-deprecation is a characteristic of the oppressed. It derives from the opinion of the oppressor's hold of the oppressed. Peasants in educational settings will discuss a generative theme in a lively manner, then they'll stop suddenly. And they'll say to the educator, excuse us, we ought to keep quiet and let you talk. Sage on the stage, not a guide by the side. The omnipresent dictator, you're the one who knows. And we don't know anything. We're fucking stupid peasants. We're just the dumb masses. We're dependent. I can't say what I want. 
Before I discover my dependence, I suffer. I let off steam at home. This is the peasant. The peasant lets off steam at home where he shouts at his children and he beats them and he despairs and he complains about his wife and he thinks everything is just dreadful. He doesn't let off steam with the boss because he thinks the boss is a superior being. Lots of times, the peasant gives vent to his sorrows by drinking. This total dependence can lead to the oppressed to be necrophilic behavior, destruction of life, their own and that of their oppressed fellows. Action and serious reflection. That's the path of freedom. The path of freedom is action and serious reflection. Critical and liberating dialogue, which presupposes action must be carried on with the oppressed at whichever stage of struggle that the oppressed is currently engaged in. For the oppressed to regain their freedom, they must stop thinking themselves as objects, and they must fight as men and women. The revolutionary leaders must realize that their own conviction of the necessity for struggle, an indispensable dimension of revolutionary wisdom, was not given to them by anyone else. If it's authentic, a liberator cannot liberate the masses. There's no such thing as a liberator. The people must liberate themselves. This conviction cannot be packaged in their soul. It cannot be packaged or sold. It's preached internally, rather by the means of the totality of the reflection than the action. Only the leader's own involvement in reality with the in historical situation can lead them to criticize the situation and to wish to change it. So traditional means, propaganda, management, manipulation, all these are means of domination. Therefore, truth and clarity cannot be achieved through these means. The necrophilist person can relate to an object, a flower, or a person, only if he possesses it. Therefore, it's a threat to his possession is a threat to himself. If he loses possession, he loses contact with the world. And he loves control. And in the act of controlling, he kills life. So, the oppressor loves to own things. He loves to own objects, and he loves to own people. And when he doesn't control, then he loses contact with the world, he doesn't understand it, and then the act of controlling people, he kills life, he or she kills life, education is liberation, and it inhibits creativity, it doesn't squander, it doesn't smash it, it allows creativity to bloom and blossom, education should be liberated, the necrophilic oppressor poses as an educator, page 73, that's an abusive relationship, recognition of one's oppression is the first stage of liberation. The oppressor is independent, and it's only nature is to be for themselves. The other is dependent, and its essence is life to exist for another person. The affirmation of individual freedom requires action. The objective transformation of reality, struggle, is how the oppressed will get free through the struggle. Our praxis, our life's processes, our core to ourselves must be directed towards a critical intervention of those submerged in the oppression. The oppressed must be their own example in the struggle for their redemption. Two stages in the pedagogy of the oppressed. The first one is free yourself. Second one, free everybody else. Educational pro projects and the systematic education are two uses for educational power. It requires political power to implement educational reform. Uh, educational products do not require political power. Uh, uh, would just be talking to them. Those are the ones that people could do on an individual basis to hinder self-affirmation. That's oppression, and that hindrance is violence. So if you're hindering a person to affirm them, themselves as being fully human, that is violence. Anything that takes the humanness from a person is violence. So the learner and the educator is a co-creator of knowledge according to free air. Freedom will be the result of the praxis which is informed action when a balance between theory and praxis is achieved. So there's a balance between theory and praxis, or uh, in theory, in, in the practical use. And where theory and practical use crosses, that's the praxis um, that is, is to be achieved. That's the balance that is to be achieved. And that informed action will come from that balance between theory and praxis. The oppressed are looked at as savages, heathens, barbarians, and because they are looked at as less than, that justifies the violence. The violence of the oppressed is a humanizing force. The oppressor uses violence to oppress, but the oppressed use violence to defend themselves, to assert their own humanity, for their own self-worth, to have an authentic existence. And it's humanizing and it's self-defense. And self-defense is intelligence. They also check the oppressor. 
and they respond in kind to the violence that the oppressor is putting on the oppressed. So it teaches the oppressor the violence that they're putting on others. And therefore, the oppressor can learn from it. The new man or woman is neither an oppressed or an oppressor. They destroy the oppressive class, and that is what will liberate the masses. That's what we want, the new man, the new woman, the new liberated, the new free, equal, partner, the new man, the new woman. The social structure is built on the notion of the oppressor enforces the, the oppressor enforces violence. Violence is a key structure for the oppressor and for white people, for white domination. In fact, beating your kids is a white thing to do. White people, lots of white people beat their kids, especially farms, rural people in farms, um, rural folks that have no sense of civilization. They still oppress them just like the state does. It's because the state oppresses, the politicians oppress the police, so the police oppress the men, and the men oppress the women, the women oppress the kids, and then the kids kick the dog, and then the dogs eat the cats. The social structure is built on the notion of the oppressor enforced violence. The oppressor consciousness objectifies all and they dominate all, and it's fundamental for the core of the oppressor's existence. They want to dominate and control and, and squeeze all life out of people. Trust is more important than generosity. I want your trust. I don't want you to give me a false generosity. I want, I want to be able to trust you. The oppressed are sheep. They are docile. The docile sheep attempt to interpret their oppression as the will of God. And when they do that, they justify it and they rationalize their oppression with a deep sense of false meaning. Um, which is just one way to accept their subordinate non-human status. Horizontal violence is the violence that's misguided and it's used towards the other members of the oppressed class and it's used indirectly to attack the oppressor. So when an Uncle Tom house Negroes attack the field Negroes, just for talking about freedom, they are attacking the field Negroes, they're attacking each other because they feel a sense of manhood and dignity when they stand up for themselves. And they're attacking each other when they should be attacking the ones who is oppressing all of them. Praxis is, uh, is, is reflection and critical dialogue and action. All these things are necessary for praxis. Praxis is the process that you go about for liberation. So the, the process of a person goes for humanization is reflecting critical dialogue with other people with action. True reflection must lead to action or it's just an armchair revolution. It takes you from dependence and docility to independence and freedom. That's what the praxis has to do for liberation. Liberation, critical dialogue, and action is to liberate yourself and to liberate everybody else. The leaders of the praxis must share in critical dialogue. It's the only possibility where there is trust. And you got to have trust. Trust is more important than generosity. The more passive the student, the more of a receptacle and less critically the student can engage with the world. Liberation requires critical consciousness and creative thought. That which you own end up owning you. Oppressors are necrophilious people. It's a lover of death, not a lover of life. They're sadistic. Oppressors are sadistic people. They only think that whatever they own is whatever it, it gives them meaning. So whatever they own ends up owning them. That's all they are is what they own. The banking model of education must be rejected. The banking model where they prescribe, the oppressor prescribes the ideas that is imposed on your brains. That has to be rejected. So no banking model of education. But for true liber liberation to occur, we have to have the problem-posing model. And the problem-posing model, they have four steps, and it's pretty simple. It's uh, the, the teacher presents the material, then the students consider the information, the students expresses their consideration, and then four step, the teacher reconsiders the initial information presented, and this will result in the unveiling of reality. So the teacher speaks their reality, the students speak their reality, and then that new uh, critical dialogue forms a different, brand new reality. And that is how the real education is learned, by that, um, by that, that model, by that class, by that here's the material, here's what I think is true, you think about it, you express your consideration, and then I either adapt or uh, come back with my arguments uh, against for any of the 
the argument, the critique that would have been against the information that I had presented if I was the teacher, the revolutionary humanistic teacher.